you know, I was in hospital for a month. For a full month, well. Yeah, because it had burst. Like, it had, it had burst, so I was bleeding in the brain. And I just started slowing down. And I just, and I just saw his face. He was just like, and he looked over to um, to my drum tech and was just like, and, and the drum tech was like, what? And then I just fell off the stool, like just completely off the stool. Wow. I was like, holy shit. And I was just like on the floor and I couldn't move. So this is the early 90s, like 91. And I think we were on, we were on a, like a little break because we had a big gig in England at the old Wembley Stadium. Wow. And about a week off. So we all headed to Ibiza, Spain. And me and Slash are like drinking in this bar. It's like midnight or one in the morning. The guy, and me and Slash are like, hey. The guy was saying like last call or something. We're like, what? And he's like, and we're like, is there any other bars open? He goes, no, but I know this club. If you go down the road, ba 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 da ba, go past to the right. So me and Slash got a car and we drove to this club and there was like a thousand people in this place. And we're like, what the hell is this? Before we went to open for Metallica, I was knocking the door. Fucking open the door. It's fucking Lars Ulrich. <laughs> this is fucking Lars. Like, That's amazing. I, I just couldn't talk. I was just like. Uh, uh. You've got to warm up. I don't give a fuck who you are. You've got to warm up. Simple as that. If you're touring and you're playing two, three, four, five shows, uh, you know, a week or whatever. Do you know what I mean? You've got to warm up, man. You've got to warm up, yeah? And what I generally tend to do is just nice and steady with a practice pad, a nice, simple little practice pad you can put into your bag with a pair of sticks, yeah? You can take on your carry-on luggage and, the whole, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Get a pad, sit. Before you go on stage, like an athlete, you must warm up, all right? If you don't, you will fuck yourself up. And it's as simple as that. ACDC are in London doing a video shoot over the weekend. Um, but Phil, Phil hasn't turned up. And I'm like going, hey mate, what's that going to do with me? What are you at? He said, are you uh, available tomorrow? Wh what? What, you, for me to do it? Yeah, are you available tomorrow? Would you, would you go? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, my missus is looking around. I like thought somebody died, you know. The headline in Glastonbury was, yeah. was, that was pretty cool and that was pretty amazing. And that came at a time when we were doing really well in Europe and the UK was, was just kind of mm. dying on its ass for us. And, and all the press were going, why are these people headlining, you know, Glastonbury, the, the, last, Glaston, the last Sunday night of, of the millennium sort of thing and we came back and I put I put war paint on my face and you know and nice. uh, and we went out and absolutely smashed it you know and we just let the music do the talking and and uh, we were like that's why we're headlining but yeah like we got arrested in Spain we just had to spend like five days in Spain in the Spanish what? so yeah what that's insane. yeah with biohazards and with um, amen really of course our younger guitar player dave um he's been like endorsed he's been like a friend of marshall since he was like i think 13 oh, so wow. since he's really young so we've always ever since the band started we've had the bit of a backing from marshall like albeit it wasn't official in the start but we used to pop up to the factory they had a big fiesta we used to jam in they helped us out with some gear you know they always serviced our gear they sent of course they own the tail drums yeah so of course they had some loan stocks they said oh do you want a drum kit i'm like of course so, yeah i'm not yeah. going to turn, turn that down yeah. yeah so they sent me a drum kit well even though we've sold close to two million albums in you know we've never earned a penny from selling records not one penny you've never not recouped one. never recouped wow. it was all advance advance videos which are half recoupable so i'm sure you'll know so you've got all that cost and you pay out everything else you know going on the account so we no, we never we never earned a penny from that so all these people that saw these number one albums and thought i was driving a ferrari and living in a castle <laughs> yeah any chance you could maybe do a, a demo because as we realized i'd never met them and i could have been absolutely rubbish they didn't know what they were getting so i literally got the track without the drums just laid down a basic track because there was a click with it and it was a case of, all right, yeah, sounds good. I'm thinking, I've never even met this band. I've met one of them, talked to them once. 
So I get to the studio and the producer who, who's done all their stuff, he's worked with massive wagons, he's done loads of stuff. And he was like a bit, not standoffish, but it was like, all right. It was a bit just slightly cool. And it was like, because he'd heard what had happened. It was like, so I've got this guy coming to my studio who's never met them, <laughs> never played. And it's, it was all done on a wing and a prayer and a leap of faith. And Overnight Sensation is, is a very good album. But at that time, we, we had, that was the toughest time of the period with me in the band because Lemmy got fairly soft on the <laughs> record. Me and Phil, we were looking at each other. He wanted to have acoustic guitar and, and the melodies were almost fucking pop melodies. And, and we go, what the hell is this? You know? <laughs> and, and we were arguing a lot at the mix. I, I believe. I left the band two, three times on that <laughs> that period, and really, and I think I think your dad did the same thing. We said, "Fuck it, you know, <laughs> let me. You can do this fucking record yourself. We don't give a shit anymore, you know." <laughs> he knew he'd met Ginger Baker and he'd met um, Buddy Rich and people like that, and um, wow. so he had like massive respect for them. Yeah, yeah. But um, he had a really bad like. Um, I think he. he he had a like something happened with Keith Moon back in the day with my dad. What? Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There was a bit of a scuffle, and um, I think from that point on, my dad like looked down at rock drummers. Like basically, I was born playing the drums, according to my mum and dad. I was born <laughs> with club feet. I was born with club feet. My feet were born upside down and inside out, um, and so I used to uh, before I had operation drag myself along to the cupboard, get out a plastic bowl, get two teaspoons and start tapping out the melodies. You need two or three snare drums and one kit. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah. That, 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 that's really, I, I have a disease and I admit it. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's an addictive, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, but I started getting, you know, I've got, I'm staring at six Ludwig kits, three, <laughs> Vist, three v Vista lights, a, uh, a 64 white marine pearl, um, a six, a sort of a mid '60s champagne sparkle and a, and a silver sparkle. I've got three big R Rogers, one in white, black, and blue, and I've got a red bass drum in the closet. Why do I need three big R kits? Because they're different colours and they look good. Travis is the perfect drummer because he like he's really in the song, like he's proper, like he he is there for the song. He's serving the song but also enhances the songs by like creating, I guess, like drum hooks, you know? Yes. Well, we, we always say sonor because, you know, like the, the German way. Um, if, and I've fallen into that, that state, if I'm talking to somebody from America, or, you know, in English, I, I just say sonar. So basically back in the day when we were actually doing it, um, I would do that swivel technique Okay. But I didn't even realize I was doing it. But it, I was doing it uh, because my legs were getting tired. And basically, you have to come up with other forms uh, because sometimes you're up there and you're running out of gas or, you know, some some nights your legs just aren't what they were the night before. Mm. So you need to come up with different variations of achieving the same type of, uh, you know, uh, sound or or beat that you're trying to do. I, I definitely don't want to make people feel inferior if I play something technical. And with all due respect to the guys out there that are playing blast beats, I respect them uh, for the amount of time and effort. It's not easy to do this. It's not easy to blast at 300 BPM and a... Hell no. It, it is impressive. However, um, in terms of my particular tastes which probably not too many people care about, but it's not really my cup of tea. I have a lot of friends of mine that are doing this kind of drumming. They're fantastic. They're good yeah. guys. Uh, I, I respect and appreciate what they're doing. However, I, I question the overall musicality of it. I said, well, I'm back in town tomorrow. He goes, well, you want to come down and meet Tony Iommi at the hotel? I said, sure. Hmm. So that's how I got the call. And I went down. And Tony had an album that I did with a band called Axis, a three-piece power trio. Right. Produced by Andy Johns, and it's really good drum sound on it. And he had that album with him, checking me out. So I met Tony, and we got along really well, hit it off. And he invited me to come down to the, to the rehearsal. This is in L.A. Uh, the next day. 
And uh, then uh, played a couple songs and they said, uh, well, cool. You know, you able to do this? I said, yep. <laughs> and we had to rehearse. We had like uh, four days rehearsal t- total. So I had to spend every waking minute listening to the stuff. But we used to actually physically have to go to a drum clinic. Yeah. If we wanted to, to be up close and personal with, with, with the drummer, you know. But I mean, so to me, it was kind of like being in a drum clinic every day yeah. you know, with, with some of my, you know, with Mickey D with Tommy Aldridge with, you know, with, with Paul Bosef with, um, you know, all these great players that I've, that I've been able to actually work with and, and, and see from, you know, two feet away every single night. And that, that was, that, that was a big um, inspiration to me too. Run for the show podcast.